Hi, everyone. I'm Meredith Ashby, I'm Director of Microbial Genomics, Infectious Disease, and Immunology Market Strategy here at PacBio. And I want to welcome everyone to the PacBio webinar series with today's focus uh, on how to analyze your PacBio metagenomics sequencing data. First off, thanks so much for participating in our poll. Um, it seems about half of you have already done some PacBio sequencing and about 15% more are planning to start soon. And I hope that uh, with the excellent content our presenters have, uh, have planned for you today, that perhaps we can bring the rest of you around uh, to trying out PacBio metagenomic sequencing for your research. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers who will be lending their expertise to the discussion. First, we have Kay Weber, a PacBio bioinformatics field application scientist in the North America East Territory. And then, um, so Christina, who many of you may know already as Kay, did her undergraduate studies at UCLA and completed her PhD on genomic prediction at UC Davis. She did an industry postdoc at Zoetis, the largest producer of medicine and vaccination for pets and livestock, where she earned the title of Senior Scientist in Bioinformatics. She's been working with us here at PacBio as a bioinformatics FAS for three years. And we also have Dan Portick joining us, our bioinformatics scientist in our applications group. Dan Portick completed his PhD at UC Berkeley, where he used targeted sequence capture approaches to understand aspects of frog evolution. He went on to do bioinformatics postdocs at UT Arlington, University of Arizona, and then most recently at the California Academy of Sciences, where he developed a variety of genomics tools. He joined PacBio in June and has been focused on developing metagenomics applications and analysis pipelines. So uh, with that, um, we have a lot of great material to cover today, and the presentation portion of the webinar will be followed by a Q&A session. You're welcome to submit your questions at any point during the webinar by typing into the question tab of your dashboard. We will be recording this webinar and making it available for download in the next few days. So with that, uh, let's get started uh, with Kay. Thank you so much, Meredith. It's really lovely to be talking to you all today. Um, so quickly, I'm going to go through a number of topics um, talking about how you can use your PacBio HiFi reads to do metagenomic analysis. So just to cover the agenda, we're going to start out with what are HiFi reads and how can you apply them to a number of different recommended protocols and analysis workflows. Then we'll discuss two examples in detail. I'm going to be presenting a shotgun sequencing experiment of a single soil metagenome sample that was sequenced on a SQL instrument and walk through the command line analysis from CCS through high canoe assembly. Then I'm going to hand off to my colleague, Dan, who will discuss a human gut microbiome experiment, which was sequenced on the SQL2 system, and his new tools for analysis, uh, which are up right now on our GitHub site. As Meredith said, we'll finish off with a Q&A so we can answer any questions you have about these applications. So to start us off, what are HiFi reads? HiFi reads represent a new paradigm in smart sequencing. As you are well aware, the old paradigm presented you with a choice between read length and accuracy. You could have the high base accuracy of short read sequencing technologies, which produce reads that are at a max a couple of hundred base pairs in length. Or you could do long read sequencing, such as with PacBio smart sequencing, and produce tens to hundreds of thousands of kilobases in length reads, but have lower base accuracy. And so this made it a tough choice for working with complex populations such as metagenome samples. With HiFi reads, we present the best of both worlds. You can produce reads which are very long, up to 25 KB in length, but also very accurate with Q20 or 99% accuracy and above. At this point, I'm gonna walk you through how these HiFi reads are generated. So we're gonna start off with the basis of smart sequencing technology. Basically what we do is we have a linear DNA fragment and this fragment is ligated with two hairpin adapters to produce our smart bell, to which the polymerase can bind and begin sequencing. As it's sequencing around this template, it produces a circular DNA smart bell, which allows it to sequence through the original template multiple times to produce what we call subreads. Subreads are each pass of the template within a longer polymerase read. And so this is all a single sequencing reaction within one ZMW. 
Each read has a random error profile and approximately 87 to 90% base accuracy or Q10. When you start producing more subreads, we can take advantage of um, the additional coverage by doing what we call circular consensus sequencing. And that's by putting together the multiple subreads to generate a higher accuracy consensus sequence. So as we add a second pass or a second subread, our consensus accuracy is expected to be approximately 95%. As we add on a third pass, we generate um, an approximately 98 to 99% accurate sequence. And at this point, we call it a hi-fi read because our minimum uh, settings for hi-fi are a minimum of three passes and Q20 accuracy. Now we'll skip ahead, um, and if you produce 10 passes, you've now increased your accuracy to 99.9% .9 or Q30. So you've gone from Q10 to Q30 by sequencing the same original template 10 times. So as you can see, the longer the polymerase read, the more subreads you're going to generate and the more accurate the resulting hi-fi read. So now that you have this really long, accurate sequence from a single organism, you can use it for your metagenomic analysis application. So now that we've established what hi-fi reads are, how can you use them for metagenomics? There are basically three approaches that we recommend. The first one is a straightforward 16S sequencing experiment. Because our read lengths are so long, you can sequence through the full 16S region or even the 16S plus ITS regions, allowing taxonomic identification down to the strain level. We're recommending a set of tools called Dada2, which were produced by our collaborator Ben Callahan at North Carolina State University, and these are freely available software for you to use. You can also do shotgun sequencing experiments. This allows you to get a deeper look into not just the identities, but the functions of the community. Um, we recommend sequencing 10 KB fragments and generating these high accuracy hi-fi reads. You can use these for metagenome assembly, as well as for taxonomic and functional profiling. So in the examples, we're gonna focus on this shotgun sequencing approach, but we do recommend if you're interested in 16S, we're going to present you with the protocols and definitely reach out to us if you'd like some more examples of how it can be used. So just to go into a little bit more detail about what you can expect if you're doing 16S and shotgun sequencing on the SQL2 instrument, um, we have two protocols out for 16S. One is working with our partner, Shoreline Biome, which has a, an all-in-one kit for extracting, amplifying, and analyzing the data. So this is a very simple protocol um, and very straightforward to use, and we really recommend checking it out. Alternatively, we also have our own protocol. This is a one-step low chimera protocol uh, for a 96 plex sequencing experiment on a SQL2 8M cells. And you do asymmetric barcoding with uh, 20 self-ordered primers. With either of these approaches, we'd expect that you'd be able to generate 3.6 million Q30 or 99.9% .9 accurate full-length 16S sequences per 8M smart cell which is approximately 37,500 Q30 reads per sample. If we compare this with our shotgun sequencing approaches, um, these can be used for, as I've said, metagenome assembly as well as profiling. We recommend setting a threshold of 99% accuracy or the default for generating hi-fi. And you can do your assemblies as long as you have 15 to 20 fold coverage. You can also detect intact genes and operons without assembly, which would allow you to profile metabolic functions of even low abundance species without the, um, even if you don't have the coverage uh, needed to do a complete assembly. You can also, if you didn't do any amplification, leverage epigenomic data to cluster contigs and plasmids from the same strain. For this approach, we recommend following our 10KB metagenome library prep protocol, which we'd expect to produce per ADEM smart cell approximately 2.4 million Q20 and above hi-fi reads. So just to present those protocols to you so you have them available, these are also available on our website. Um, this is a screenshot of our 16S protocol, um, and this includes the primer sequences, the PCR protocol for approximately 1.5 KB um, in inserts, um, template preparation instructions, as well as multiplexing and sequencing recommendations. And as I've mentioned, we'd recommend using data too, or KIME for analysis. And as I mentioned also, um, we have our partner Shoreline Biome that has an integrated solution for full-length 16S sequencing. 
uh, we'd recommend checking with their manual or, or reaching out to them um, so that you can get guidance in terms of how much input material you need for different tissues. But it's a really efficient protocol um, and makes it really easy to, to do your prep. Walking through the analysis options, um, Shoreline Biome is probably the most straightforward. You just run your CCS analysis, um, setting a higher threshold of stringency for the accuracy. So as I've mentioned, uh, Q30 or 99.9% .9 accuracy, and then follow up with analysis with their SB analyzer software. However, if you're working with our protocol, the analysis is still very simple. Um, you do the same CCS analysis. Then you would demultiplex your reads with a tool called Lima. In a few minutes, I'll, I'll walk through the steps for doing that. Um, generate FASTQ format data, um, either through export if you're working in our SmartLink software or using a conversion tool. And then in our bioconductor, you can work with the data two tools from Ben Callahan's lab um, with the paper cited down here. Shifting over to our shotgun sequencing protocol, um, this protocol does require higher input amounts of high molecular weight DNA compared to 16S sequencing, but, but provides a deeper profiling of your sample. Um, the basic steps are um, that you can use this, uh, oh, sorry, um, that you can use this data to produce hi-fi reads and then follow up with assembly, taxonomic binning, and functional profiling. And we're going to discuss uh, the steps for that in just a minute. Um, but before we do that, um, I'd like to cover some points of the experimental design, just to make sure you get the most value out of your sequencing experiments. So one of the first questions you should ask yourself when you're doing a shotgun metagenomics experiment is, what is the goal of your study? Are you mostly interested in detecting all of the species present in the sample, in doing comprehensive gene discovery, where you need slightly higher coverage, or in doing complete genome assembly, where you need still higher coverage? We'd recommend if you're doing species level detection, you only need 100 Q20 and above hi-fi reads for that. Um, if you're interested in doing, de doing gene discovery, we'd recommend at least 3,000 hi-fi reads or approximately five-fold coverage. And if you're interested in doing complete genome assembly, we'd recommend 12,000 hi-fi reads or approximately 20-fold coverage. Now, these are the coverages per species. So the next question you should ask yourself is, how rare is the rarest species you wanna be able to detect in your sample? For example, if you're interested in seeing a species that present, is present at 1% abundance in your sample, so um, that species accounts for 1% of the total reads in the sequence sample, then you can expect that you'd be able to generate 24,000 reads from that 1% abundant species if you ran just one sample on one 8M smart cell. Um, which gives you plenty of reads to do complete genome assembly. Just to look at another way, um, I'm gonna put up three different sequencing experiments, um, a single plex, a two plex, and a three plex on an 8M smart cell from a SQL2 instrument. And just posit what are the different things you can do for a rare species in this pool. So if you don't multiplex, if you just have one sample on an 8M smart cell, then if you're looking at a species at 1% abundance, you'd expect to be able to have 24,000 reads, which is plenty for doing assembly. If you look at a species that's five times more rare than that, then you'd get approximately 4,800 reads, which is sufficient for gene profiling. If we compare that to a two-plex experiment, then we still have enough reads for assembly at 1% abundance, but at 0.2% abundance, now we really only have enough reads for detection and not profiling. If we go to a three-plex, now at 1% abundance, we're talking about more of a profiling experiment and then detection at 0.2% abundance. So I hope that these examples have illustrated how to determine the coverage needed for your metagenomic sample when you're doing shotgun sequencing. So going back to the bioinformatics analysis, um, there are a number of tools that you can work with um, in terms of doing your data analysis, but we'll walk through some options that have worked really well for us. So the first step is always to do that CCS analysis so you can generate these hi-fi reads. And in this case, you can use our, your default settings, which will generate Q20 and above accuracy. If you did multiplex, we'd recommend demultiplexing with the tool called Lima. Then you can perform assembly. Um, we'd recommend using High Canoe in Canoe versions 2.0 and above. Um, we'll walk through the, the commands for that in a few minutes. 
You can also do gene prediction using your HiFi reads. Um, there are multiple tools out there. We've worked with FRAG Gene Scan and Prodigal that both work very well. Um, next, we'd recommend using a new set of tools developed by Dan Portek, who will be presenting them in a few minutes. Um, and these tools can perform genome binning um, of the CANU contigs, as well as taxonomic and functional profiling of the HiFi reads based on a nucleotide or protein database. And they make use of a number of really great tools, including Minimap2, Metabat2, Diamond, and Megan. There are other tools out there. This is by no means a comprehensive list. So if you're interested in trying out other HiFi assemblers, there's a lot of great assemblers coming out. Um, HiFi ASM works very well. Um, Fly works very well. Um, and there is a tool for taxonomic binning and profiling called Patrick. Um, honestly, we found that our PB Metagenomics tools does a better job, but feel free to test multiple tools um, to determine what will work best for your sample. So at this point, I'd like to transition to talking about a SQL study on a soil microbiome. So this was one sample sequenced on two 1M SQL smart cells. We were collaborating with a group called Second Genome, which is a microbiome research company based in South San Francisco. And their question was that they were already doing short read based um, analysis for gene discovery, and they wanted to understand how long read might help them to supplement that pipeline. In order to answer that question, we tested with an environmental sample as a test case, and this has all been described in a blog post on our website, um, which we'd recommend checking out if you'd like a more thorough discussion of this. So the main questions that they had were, what are the species present in this population and what genes do they have? Um, since they'd already tried to answer these with short read data, we're able to also do a comparison between the short read and long read, read approaches in terms of how well we're able to answer these questions. So just to reiterate the design for the experiment, um, we sequenced this enriched soil community on a SQL 1M system on two smart cells. The meta, meta genome assembly was used to recover the complete or almost complete genomes of the more abundant organisms in the pool. And HiFi reads were also used directly for gene prediction and functional profiling without assembly. And that's facilitated by the length and accuracy of the HiFi reads. Finally, we went back and did a comparison with the short read analyses that were already done by second genome to see what additional benefit long read did in this study. So just to walk through the data characteristics for this study, um, as I mentioned, we've sequenced on two 1M smart cells, and you can see that each smart cell yields approximately 10 times less data than the 8M smart cells that I was discussing earlier in the presentation. So please bear that in mind when you're doing your experimental design calculations. However, we found that two 1M smart cells would be enough to get us the coverage we needed for this experiment, and so we proceeded. Um, we produced approximately 500,000 reads or four gigabases of error corrected data, and that's um, error corrected to at least 99% accuracy. This is the distribution of HiFi read length. So you can see that the mode is around 8 KB, but the, the range in size ranges from below 2.5 KB up to 20 KB. We can also see that these error corrected reads had very high accuracy. While our minimum cutoff was Q10, most of the reads were in excess of Q30 accuracy. So this is very highly accurate data and was wonderful to work with for our, our uh, subsequent analysis. Okay, so in terms of the steps we did, we took the HiFi reads, performed assembly with CANU to generate contigs, predicted genes on the original reads. Um, this typically, um, resulted in multiple genes being predicted for each read because the reads are approximately 8 to 10 KB in length and the predicted genes are only approximately 900 base pairs to 1 KB in length. This pool of predicted genes was dereplicated as some of the same genes would be present on multiple HiFi reads depending on the relative abundance of the organism um, and then we could localize these predicted genes on the contigs generated from the assembly. To go into a little bit more detail about CANU and High CANU, um, CANU is the successor of the Solera assembler. It's specifically designed for noisy single molecule sequences, and it has three modules, correct, trim, and assemble. For HiFi reads, you can, um, you can exclude the normal correction, 
And the high canoe um, set of settings actually does its own correction using run length encoding, uh, i.e. homopolymer compression, removing errors that occur in only a single read, and ignoring mapping ambiguities in dinucleotide repeats. So by taking these additional steps, they're able to further increase the accuracy of the hi-fi reads, um, which is very helpful in subsequent assembly. If we take a look at the metagenome assembly results, um, which we see here on this slide, um, I've got them summarized in a table, as well as this bandage plot of the assembly graph. As you can see, the two 1M smart cells of data generated um, highly contiguous assembly. The mean contig size was 93 KB, um, but it produced a total metagenome size of about 100 MB, with max contigs um, of basically complete genomes. You can see actually in here that we have two closed bacterial genomes, as well as several circular plasmids. If you're interested in this long string up here in the top, these are contigs from closely related organisms, Bacillus thuringiensis, and possibly from different strains. So we're really capturing a lot of very complete genomes for the more abundant species, as well as contigs um, from some of the less abundant species. Now, if we were to compare with the um, short read assembly results that Second Genome provided with us, here we're looking at Acinetobacter species. Um, this is actually a spike in control, so we know this, the strain exactly. And so we were able to compare with the NCBI reference. And you can see in this case that the assembly from short read data was very fragmented. So that makes it really hard to determine whether some parts are missing or reordered and it makes it more difficult to assess which genes belong together in the same operons or metabolic pathways. And this is important, for example, to find genes involved in the synthesis of natural products, such as antibiotics, um, which tend to be collinear. So that's part of why there's some value in doing long read assembly, because then you get a much more contiguous assembly, um, which you can see matches very closely with the reference and actually in fewer contigs, which is very different from the more fragmented assembly from the short read data. Now, if we shift over to looking at the gene prediction, um, while short reads are a good choice um, when the number of observations is critical, like determining community composition, they produce highly fragmented assemblies and so are not well suited for gene discovery. Taking a look at three spike in organisms, we performed that gene discovery, dereplication, and annotation to the contigs, as I mentioned earlier. And in comparing with the reference data, we found that the PacBio HiFi data produced more predicted genes than the short read data. Second Genome actually even uh, performed a cost analysis. And when they compared the number of predicted genes found versus the cost of the project, they found that PacBio was even more clearly the winner as more genes were found per thousand dollars invested. Another consideration is that once you have um, these hi-fi reads, particularly several KB long reads, is that you're recovering intact gene clusters that can produce these bioactive natural products. Um, here we're looking at the protein alignment done with Diamond and the results visualized with Megan, um, and the number of reads um, is indicated by the darkness of color. So you can see that you're actually getting greater depth um, in your functional classification from the PacBio hi-fi reads than the short read data because you'll be able to predict more genes. Um, and so this allows you to have more depth and precision in your functional profiling. And as I mentioned, um, you also are generating these clusters because you have multiple genes on a single hi-fi read or a single contig. So that allows you to associate them with each other, which provides you additional insight into the pathways of these related genes. So um, at this stage, I'd like to do a little walkthrough of the basic commands for doing CCS, demultiplexing, and assembly with CANU. And these slides will be available to you after the presentation. So if you'd like to go through and do them yourself, um, you're welcome to do that and they should work for you. So the first thing is setting up your environment. Um, most of our tools are available as Bioconda packages. Um, so you can set them up using uh, Anaconda or Miniconda in a Linux environment. The first thing you're gonna do is set up the basic channels, um, defaults, Bioconda, Conda Forge, make sure everything is up to date, and then create a, a little environment to install the rest of our packages that we'd recommend. So in this case, um, I'm creating a, an environment called Metagenome Tools 
using Python 3.7. And then adding in the packages, PB Core Tools, which is basic uh, working with our PacBio data, um, PB CCS for doing the CCS analysis, Lima for demultiplexing, and BAM to FASTX for file format conversion from BAM to FASTQ or FASTA formats. And then I'm going ahead and activating this environment so I can work with the tools. Moving to CCS, um, CCS analysis is very straightforward. Uh, you just provide the subreads BAM, which is the native format for SQL and SQL2 data, and then produce a CCS BAM, which has unaligned error corrected reads. Now, I do recommend if you're working with SQL2 data that you chunk up this analysis um, so that you can do it in a more efficient manner. And you can do that very easily with the flag dash dash chunk. Um, so in this case, I've chunked it into 100 different chunks. Um, for each command, I just tell it um, which chunk to work on and provide it with four threads. Um, before doing any of this, I index the BAM and at the end, merge it back together and index the resulting BAM. So it's really very straightforward, very parallelizable because CCS is being performed per ZMW, you know, within each chunk. So that makes it really easy um, to, to perform your analysis. Moving into demultiplexing, you're going to want to take that merge CCS BAM and provide it a set of barcode sequences in FASTA format and then generate um, a set of demultiplex results. Now, there are a lot of different configurable parameters for the demultiplexing. I provide a set of um, useful settings here, um, but there are many more options. Definitely reach out to us if you have questions, and a lot of these are documented on the GitHub page for our barcoding application. But just briefly, the ones that I'm using in this case are CCS, because it is CCS data that we're demultiplexing. Same, which indicates that it's symmetrically barcoded. The same barcode is on both um, one end and the other end of the sequence. So for example, if you were doing 16S sequencing, you'd use dash dash different to indicate that it's asymmetrically barcoded. PCAS gets a little complicated, but basically it's just testing the, the set of barcodes used to determine which combinations are present in the data, and then only providing results for those. Split BAM named is just splitting the results into separate BAMs per sample and naming them based on the barcode names. Dump remove saves any reads that were not demultiplexed into its own file. And then I'm setting a minimum score of 75 out of 100 just to make sure I'm only getting the reads that are very well assigned to their barcode combinations. File, for, file format conversion is very straightforward as well. Um, we have a tool called BAM to FASTQ, and so you just provide the BAM that you want to convert to FASTQ format, give it a name, and in this case, I'm turning off gzip compression. Finally, for doing the assembly, if you're doing it with High Canoe, we'd recommend installing Canoe 2.0 and above. I think 2.1 was released last month. Um, and we're basically just following the developer instructions. Uh, they don't recommend using Bioconda to install Canoe, so you're going to want to do a separate um, independent installation, um, and this is just following those recommendations from their website, website which is linked down here. Um, and it's really very straightforward. You just provide the mode, um, some information in terms of where to get the data and where to put the results, the genome size, and then you're going to want to select PacBio HiFi to run High Canoe. So here's an example command. Um, so we're calling canoe, telling it to assemble, writing the files to a certain set of names and directories. In this case, I'm using the assumption that the metagenome size is 100 MB, but you can set this to whatever your best estimate is of total metagenome size. And one thing that's important to input for metagenomic analysis is setting a high max input coverage. Uh, canoe 2.0 and uh, above both do downsampling by default, and you probably don't want to do that if you're working with a complex population. So if you set this to some high value, um, it, it won't make it that much more uh, time consuming to run, and you'll make sure that you get nice contiguous assemblies out at the end. As I mentioned, run it with PacBio HiFi, um, and then we just have a set of bad options that were recommended by the developer and have worked very well for us for doing uh, HiFi assemblies. If you need to tune Canoe for your grid, um, there are a couple of options. I haven't provided example syntax, but you're gonna to wanna to set that based on your cluster and what you're working with. And just a little tip, um, we found that once you've generated the contigs, you can do some basic filtering uh, for small duplicate contigs by excluding contigs where the FASTA header includes suggest bubble equals yes. So you can go ahead and search for that, remove those, or to think of another way, include only the contig uh, contigs where suggest bubble equals no. 
So um, at this point, I wanna thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's wonderful to talk about these tools um, since they perform so beautifully with Hi-Fi Reads. Um, and at this point, transition over to my colleague, Dan, to talk about our SQL2 study on the human gut microbiome and his new tools, uh, PB Metagenomics tools. So uh, take it away, Dan. Great, so we'll go ahead and get set up here. Okay, are we all viewing my slides at this point? Looks great, Dan. Okay, great. So thanks, Kay. Um, I will be talking to you today about a couple of new workflows that we've developed. And to do this, I'm gonna demonstrate um, the utility of these workflows with a case study. So this case study was a shotgun metagenomics project that used type two diabetes gut samples. So these are fecal microbiome samples. The premise of this study is that uh, imbalances in the gut microbiota are associated with diabetes, but the specific strains or functions implicated in disease are unclear. So previous studies have demonstrated um, uh, these findings, but it's still left a lot to resolve. Um, and so this was essentially a pilot study to see what additional insights HiFi reads could provide. So in terms of sampling, uh, there were three samples selected per group, and there were three groups in total. So there was a healthy control group, a type 2 diabetes plus cardiovascular disease group, and then a type 2 diabetes group only. So there were nine samples in total. Each of the nine samples was sequenced on its own SQL2 smart cell 8M. And this yielded 2 to 2.5 million HiFi reads per sample. And the average length of those HiFi reads was between 8 and 10 KB. So um, there are a few new uh, pipelines that are very recently made available, and these are PacBio specific. And the real goal here is to try to make uh, several common tasks for shotgun metagenomics very accessible and very easy and very streamlined. So these pipelines are all available as Snakemake workflows on our GitHub repo and PB metagenomics tools. And the reason um, for using Snakemake is that it's a Python-based workflow manager it works very well in an Anaconda environment. And I think it really provides three main advantages. So the first one is portability. So you can use Anaconda in the workflow to install all the programs and their dependencies. So you can run each step in the proper environment. The second is checkpointing. So if an analysis is interrupted or if there's an error for some reason, it can essentially resume on the last completed step, which is great for long workflows. And then the third is that it can be run locally or it can be run on an HPC environment. And so it's very flexible in terms of the resources that you have available. So there are two major topics covered by these pipelines, and those include metagenomic binning and taxonomic and functional profiling. So with regards to metagenomic binning, the purpose is to identify and characterize high quality metagenome assembled genomes or MAGs from the assemblies. And this requires high fi reads and assemblies on a per sample basis. And then we use the genome binning pipeline for all of the subsequent steps. And with regards to taxonomic and functional profiling, the purpose is to prepare inputs for interactive analyses in Megan 6, where you can look at taxonomic and functional annotations. And so to use this workflow requires HiFi reads and an external database, and that can be a protein database or a nucleotide database. And there are two variations of these workflows. So there is the protein version and the nucleotide version. Both of them offer the opportunity for taxonomic annotation. But if you use the protein version, this also gives you access to functional annotations. Um, and so there are important differences here. And so I'll only be focusing on the protein version because that is primarily what uh, researchers are using. But we do have that nucleotide one available as well. So we're just going to start out by sort of going through the workflows and what's happening. We'll start with the metagenomic binning workflow. So the inputs for this, as I mentioned, are HiFi reads and contigs. 
And in this case study, we were using HiPNU to generate those contigs. Now for each step of the workflow, I'm gonna be showing a purple box that has the name of the program that is used to run the step. To the right of the box is just a summary of what that step is doing. And then for some steps, there'll be additional information below. And I'm going to be showing the command line reference for each of these programs. Um, if you're interested in it, it's there. Otherwise, uh, I'll just emphasize that all of these commands are inside the snake files for each of these workflows. So you can reference them here or there. Um, they may just be a little bit distracting in this context. So feel free to ignore those uh, if you'd like. So this first step of the workflow involves mapping HiFi reads to the contigs, again, in this case from HiCanoe. And we're using Minimap2 to do this. And we're generating a BAM file here, which will allow us to get coverage estimates for all of those contigs. And the next step, we're basically feeding those coverage uh, estimates and those contigs directly into Metabat2. And that's the program that is actually going to construct the genome bins. After those genome bins are constructed, we're using CheckM to assess the quality of those resulting bins. So CheckM provides a variety of summary statistics, but the three that we're interested in most are the percent completeness of the genomes, percent contamination within the genomes, and the number of contigs that are required to create that genome bin. And once we have all those summary metrics, we can then perform a filtering step. And so here we're applying thresholds for these quality scores. And this is done using a custom script, but basically what we're doing um, under the default settings is requiring greater than 70% completeness for the genome, less than 10% contamination per genome, and fewer than 10 contigs required to create that genome bin. And those are the default settings, but they can be easily changed so you can make those criteria more or less stringent depending on your needs. And for all of those bins that pass this filtering step, um, we're then preparing those as inputs for the, the subsequent step. And the final step of this workflow is to use the Genome Taxonomy Database Toolkit to assign a taxonomy to those genomes. So the Genome Taxonomy Database is a curated database of over 200,000 complete bacterial genome references. And their companion toolkit is designed to help you place your own sequences within that reference set. And depending on how well they match, it can assign a strain level identification, a species level identification, and in cases where things are really divergent, it can even give you just a genus level identification. And so that's particularly useful in sort of figuring out what is actually being represented by these mags uh, at the end of this pipeline. So we can give them names. And so the outputs include the high quality metagenome assembled genomes, the MAGs, so you have the sequences for these. Um, there are a variety of plots that show the MAG characteristics. There are also uh, summary files with just about every piece of information you could hope for, for all of the MAGs that pass these filtering steps. And finally, there are paired FASTA files of the MAG sequences and the reference sequences that were found using the genome taxonomy database. And what that allows you to do is hold genome alignments create dot plots and other things like that downstream. So below I'm showing a couple examples of the plots that are output by the pipeline. We're gonna focus on the plot on the left first. So the plot on the left is showing all of the genome bins that were constructed using Metabat2. And you can see that this plot on the x-axis is showing genome completeness, and on the y-axis is genome contamination. And these scores range from zero to 100 in both cases. So there are a lot of low quality uh, mags that were constructed using Metabat2. Now using the default filtering settings, we're basically targeting the mags that are in that blue box in the bottom right hand corner. And so after filtering, if you look to the plot on the right, you can see which mags are retained. And so here there are roughly 20 or so high quality mags that come out of this pipeline. And you can see that the scale of the axes change now we're looking at mags that are between 70% and 100% completeness, and all of these actually have below 5% contamination. And if you look to the right of the plot, you can see that there are a bunch of mags that are clustered at above 98% completeness, which is really excellent. So if you look carefully at those dots, you may notice some small numbers, and those numbers represent the number of contigs that are contained in each of those mags. And there are quite a few of them that say one, 
And this is really the perfect scenario. So in the case where there's one contig, this is essentially we've reconstructed a greater than 98% genome just in the high canoe assembly set by itself. And you can see that there are some variation there. There are between two and seven contigs um, that are in these other mags. And those are really the result of the genome binning step in Metabat2. Right, so the combination of assembly and binning and quality control allows us to really maximize the information that's contained in our assembly. And so the last thing I'm going to show is just a plot um, from one of our type 2 diabetes samples. So this is one of the control samples. And again, I'm showing the same plot of completeness versus contamination. And if you notice, there are quite a few dots clustered to the right side, indicating very high completeness. And in this case, I've color coded all of those mags that have a single contig. And to the right, I'm just showing some additional information that's easily accessible through the pipeline. So the genome sizes of these mags ranges from 2.2 to 4.6 million base pairs. We see that the coverage estimates are between 70x to 1,000x across the length of that entire genome. And then we can see some of the names that have been assigned based on the genome taxonomy database. So this is just for one sample. But if we zoom out and consider all nine samples in the type 2 diabetes uh, study, this allowed us to recover 170 high quality mags. And of those, 86 were single contigs. And so those really represent the best of the best. And at that point, they're essentially ready for polishing and publication. So this workflow makes it very easy to uh, take your assembly data and output these high quality mags. Okay. So now we're going to shift gears and focus on the taxonomic and functional profiling workflow. And specifically, I'll be talking about the protein version. So the inputs for this require a HiFi reads and an external protein database. And we highly recommend the NCBI non-redundant protein database. And the first step of this workflow is to perform a translation alignment of the HiFi reads to this protein database and to do this, we're using Diamond, and we're also using long read appropriate settings. So as Kay mentioned, uh, on average, we find about eight genes per HiFi read. And it's very um, likely that some of these genes are going to be better matches to the database than others. And in some cases, the number of hits that are recovered for that gene could swamp out the signal for all the other genes on that read. And so what long read settings means here is just that we're ensuring that all hits are going to be reported for those genes along the length of the read. And this is just a much more accurate representation of our data type. Also, uh, under the hood, the step is being uh, parallelized by splitting the HiFi reads file into four different pieces. And this will provide a four times speed up if you're able to run these steps simultaneously on HPC. But it also serves to reduce the resources required to run it locally. So even if you run these sequentially, it will reduce the resources required by Diamond, which tends to be a little bit greedy when it comes to memory requirements and thread requirements. And so after these alignments are performed, the output is this sort of bizarre um, protein SAM file. And so normally a SAM file will have nucleotides in it, but in this case, it's showing amino acids. And this is something that can be plugged into um, some of Megan's companion tools. But before we do that, um, we have to merge those protein SAM files from our four different pieces. And along the way, we're also filtering for potentially um, illegal characters in the cigar strings, which can cause errors in the conversion process. And so that's being performed using a custom script. Once we have a single merged protein SAM file, we can then easily convert it to the RMA format using the companion tool SAM to RMA, which is available in Megan. And again, we're using long read settings to tell Megan that there are multiple genes present on all of the reads that we're providing. And so in the end, the outputs are long read RMA format files, which are ready to be plugged directly into Megan for analysis. So we ran this pipeline for all nine samples in the type 2 diabetes study. And here I'm showing some example taxonomic results that were obtained in Megan. So across all the samples, we found about 200 taxa. The plot on the left shows those taxa 
and their relative abundances across all nine of the samples. So the tacks are on the y-axis and our samples are on the x-axis. And this is a bubble plot where the size of the bubble, if they're larger, that indicates that there's a higher abundance. And if they're smaller, it represents a lower abundance. So if we just scan that plot from left to right, you may notice that there are some differences between the control group and the type 2 diabetes groups. And you may also notice to the right of the plot that one of the type 2 diabetes samples is very unique uh, and very distinct from all other samples included in the study. So that was an interesting finding. And to the right, I'm showing a plot. Uh, this is a PCA plot, which just shows the clustering of these samples based on their taxonomic profiles. And again, we can see that the control group is somewhat distinct from these type 2 diabetes groups. And there is that very unique um, type 2 diabetes samples sort of off on its own. So we exported the taxonomic counts from Megan, and we looked at the top 20 species with the greatest change in abundance between the control group and both of the type 2 diabetes groups. And we actually found a trend for more beneficial bacteria being present in the control group and a higher abundance of pathogenic bacteria being present in the type 2 diabetes groups. So there did seem to be some some pretty important differences in the bacterial assemblages between these groups. And here I'm just showing some of the results for the functional profiling. So in this case, um, we exported functional class counts from the seed database, and then we constructed a heat map of the top 15 functional differences between the control group and the type 2 diabetes groups. So on this heat map, the lighter color represents lower abundance, and in the dark red color, uh, this represents higher abundance. And you can see just looking uh, at this heat map that there are some differences between the control group and the type 2 diabetes groups. And in this case, the control group is showing lower representation for all 15 of these functional classes. And again, we kind of see that um, bizarre type 2 diabetes sample is sort of intermediate between these groups. So, in addition to taxonomic differences, we also found some evidence for important functional differences that are driven by differences in bacterial composition across these groups. So this is an example of just some of the analyses that can be done using Megan, um, using the long read input format RMA files. But there are plenty of other features that I, I haven't discussed here as Megan is pretty extensive. Um, so here I'm just showing a quick snapshot of some of the programs that are used in these workflows and their corresponding publications. And the last thing uh, that I'd like to say before handing it back over to Kay is that all of the workflows are available on GitHub. Um, I'm currently working on the documentation for those, so that's not up and running yet, but uh, I hope to have that completed within the next two weeks. So advanced users of SnakeMake may be able to work with those workflows immediately, um, but uh, less advanced users may want to wait until that documentation is available before beginning this. Um, but you can feel free to reach out to us for help with these workflows if your needs are more immediate. So with that, I think I will hand it back over to you, Kay. Thank you so much, Dan. That was fantastic. It's very exciting to have these new tools out for people to use. I'm just moving back to sharing my screen. And I just want to leave you with a, a few conclusions from what we've talked about today. So I hope that you're convinced by now that long read sequencing produces full length 16S sequences, as well as more contiguous assemblies and more complete genes discovered from your metagenomic samples. We offer protocols for 16S and shotgun metagenome sequencing on both the SQL and SQL2 systems, which supports taxonomic profiling, genome assembly, and genome, gene finding and discovery. The SQL2 system um, allows deeper sequencing per smart cell, which facilitates higher plex levels and better resolution of low abundance populations compared to SQL. As we've talked about, our PacBio software tools, which are available via Bioconda, GitHub, and SmartLink, are essential for the initial error correction, which is using CCS to produce HiFi reads and support pre-processing pre um, for third-party assembly and metagenomics tools. 
And just to cover where to get more information, um, we have on our website a page dedicated to complex population applications. Um, this also includes lists of recent publications, posters, video and webinar links, and PacBio literature such as protocols and case studies. We also invite you to take a look at our GitHub, where we have a list of our Bioconda packages at PB Bioconda, as well as a repo dedicated to PB Metagenomics tools and other repos for other applications. If you need access to our barcode files, you can find those on our multiplexing page, and there are example data sets of both 16S and shotgun data up on our website under data sets. I'd also recommend taking a look at our other bioinformatics webinar recordings. Um, after some time uh, after the webinars, we upload these videos to YouTube under a PacBio Bioinformatics webinars playlist. Um, I've got the link here, um, and this webinar is included in that. So you'll get the slides and the recording pretty quickly after, and then after some time, it'll be up and available on YouTube if you'd like to share it with any of your colleagues or students. And with that, um, if you have any further questions after the webinar is over, please email us at support at pacb.com or reach out to your local sales rep or FAS. And at this point, um, I'd like to hand it to Meredith to talk about a, a new opportunity that's coming soon. All right, thanks Kay and Dan for those really great talks. Uh, so if you look at your screen now, I would like to announce that our annual Microbial Smart Grant uh, program will be opening on September 28th. You can apply by describing your project in 300 words or fewer to win up to six sample preps and six smart cells 8M of sequencing plus bioinformatics support. You can bookmark our Smart Grant page at www.pacb.com slash SMRT grant and check back on September 28th to submit your proposal. So let's move into our Q&A session now. And I'd like to uh, invite Kay and Dan to turn on their webcams again. And if you have questions for our speakers, please uh, take a moment to enter them now into the question window in your dashboard. And while everyone is typing in their questions, we have uh, one more poll question for you. So what is your biggest concern with long read sequencing of metagenomes? And uh, hopefully we have addressed uh, some of these for you already. And as Kay mentioned, if we haven't, you should absolutely reach out uh, to our scientists at tech support at pecky.com. Okay, so you can see quickly here, uh, it seems like um, your biggest concerns are very, fairly balanced quests across all of the different things that we mentioned, uh, including uh, accuracy, yield cost, and input amounts. And I'm happy to see that ease of use is not one of your concerns. Uh, and hopefully that's because of all the wonderful work Kay has done in the field, making sure uh, that all of your questions are quickly answered. All right, so let's go ahead and ask a few questions now. Um, so we have a couple questions on the topic of DNA extraction kits. Um, and so um, one of them is a representative one, says for metagenomic use of PecBio, what is the recommended D DNA extraction um, method? Is bead beating base lysis appropriate? Um, so I can take that one actually. So we, uh, we have found that our customers have success with a wide range of different commercially available DNA extraction kits. Uh, we've had folks use um, the Lucigen Master Pure DNA Kit, um, Power, Kyogen's Power Soil Pro, uh, also the Magatract High Molecular Weight Microbial DNA Kit from Kyogen. Uh, and then we also have some uh, users who have used the Kaya Symphony uh, uh, Power People Pro Kit also from, from Kyogen. Uh, and so the bottom line is that the way that we have designed uh, the protocol to work and using uh, insert sizes that are between 6 to 10 uh, KB in length, uh, we did that specifically because we have found that that is a, um, a molecular weight that most people can achieve pretty easily using commercially available kits. Okay, and let's have another question. 
Uh, let's see. So here's one. Uh, how much input material do I need? Sure, um, so I can answer that. Um, we recommend 1.5 micrograms for shotgun sequencing experiments. And I'm just pulling up the slide on 16S. Um, we recommend at least one to two nanograms um, for doing our 16S uh, workflow, um, but we've seen it work with as low as 25 picograms as well. Um, and I, as mentioned in the presentation, I would recommend reaching out um, to Shoreline uh, Biome if you have questions about their protocol because their uh, input material is actually tissue. Um, so they can give you recommendations in terms of different kinds of tissue uh, and how much input amount they'd recommend. Okay, uh, is it possible to characterize shotgun samples to strain level resolution? Yes, you absolutely can. Um, one of the lovely things about HiFi Read is the high level of base level, uh, base accuracy. Um, and because they're so highly accurate, um, so long as you have enough coverage of the species, you're able to resolve it to strain level. That's terrific. Uh, so we have a couple questions about canoe now. Um, hi, if we don't have any estimation of metagenome size in the case of canoe assembly, what's the best practice? Is there a way to calculate it? And if not, How's the parameter going to affect our assembly? So I would say that you can probably just set it to a large value. Um, in, in our case, like I often use 100 meg megabases as an example. Um, and then, you know, you can always try modulating with a couple different, couple different values and see if it makes any difference in the assembly. Um, but I haven't found it to have a very large impact as long as you set it to a reasonable value. I don't know, Dan, do you have any comments on that? Uh, no, I think that's uh, those are great suggestions. Okay, and then also on the topic of canoe, how well do other hi-fi assemblers perform compared with high canoe? It's a great question. Um, so we've done the most testing using canoe and high canoe. Um, that being said, uh, new hi-fi assemblers are coming out all the time. Um, we've just released our IPA or improved phased assembler. Um, there's also hi-fi ASM, um, which in their publication, they uh, also included looking at a bacterial sample, um, but we haven't done extensive testing of a lot of these new assemblers uh, using metagenomic samples. So I definitely think it's an area to watch and potentially consider trying several assemblers, but I don't think you can go wrong using high canoe. Okay. Um, do you have a way to deplete host contamination when making metagenomes? So that's a that's a great question. Um, certainly, there are ways of removing that um, information for, bioinformatically. Like certainly, you can exclude it from further analysis. But um, it sort of sounds like from your question that you're trying to exclude it perhaps upfront. Um, and in that case, uh, it may come down to the method of extraction, perhaps. Um, but I, I would tend to defer to my wet lab FAS colleagues. And so perhaps we'll follow up with an email to you with more information on that side of things. But certainly on the bioinformatics side, you can exclude reads that um, you basically can just align against an alternative genome and exclude any reads that are assigned to human, for example, if it was a human fecal sample. Um, Dan, do you have any comments on that as well? Yeah, so I, I saw that question and I tried to respond to it um, via text. And I agree that bioinformatically, you can essentially map your reads to whatever the host organism is, whatever uh, reference you have available. And you can find which reads are really close matches and just eliminate them from your file before continuing with assembly or other analysis. But we do see a, a very, very small amount of contamination from the host. It's usually less than 1%. Perfect. Yeah. I, I, go ahead, I, Meredith. I was going to say that I know there are a couple commercially available kits out there to remove host DNA, and a lot of these operate on the principle of precipitating DNA that has uh, like CPG methylation or other types of methylation that are uh, more commonly seen in eukaryotes. Uh, and what I've heard back from many of our customers is that these methods don't work so well, even in the case of short read methods and we have not extensively tested them in-house either so i think that the best approach for now at least was probably to try to deal with it bioinformatically um okay let's see hi is the current shotgun metagenome analysis pipeline also suited for co-assemblies of multiple samples 
Well, I mean, so we would typically recommend um, applying barcodes so that you can demultiplex the samples up front. That's going to give you better confidence in terms of, you know, which reads are assigned to one sample versus another. Um, that being said, if you did have a, a pool where you were unable to, to barcode it, um, you could certainly proceed with analysis, um, but it would be more difficult to determine, you know, which sample a, a given read you know, derived from, unless you had uh, knowledge going in that certain things would only be seen in, in one sample versus another. So you could certainly sequence pooled samples, um, but depending on how you want to interpret them, it might be better to barcode if you can. Um, I'll just say one thing about this very quickly. So I think um, it's possible that this question might refer to having those individual samples and then pooling all the reads for assembly. And this is thought to give you sort of a more complete assembly because you just have more information and more data. Um, that is possible to run through the MAG identification pipeline, but what you're likely to find if these uh, samples represent different individuals or time points or uh, locations, um, depending on what you're sequencing, you might find a lot of contamination in those resulting MAGs, and that's because you're really assembling strains together that wouldn't necessarily be assembled together if you were to do the assembly separately for those samples. So you might see some effect in terms of decontamination, and that might cause some of them to fail the QC. So um, if you want to try it out, I, I encourage you to do so, but you might need to adjust some of those default parameters um, with regards to filtering in order to make uh, the results pass through to the end. So that's a great question. Awesome. Uh, another question about assembly in the MAG pipeline. What makes Minimap the ideal read mapper for the MAG's pipeline? Or how was Minimapper chosen over other read mappers? It's designed specifically for long reads. Um, the short read aligners just don't work well with our data type. And Minimap 2 is fast, it's very efficient, and it produces really good results. So on that topic too, somebody specifically asked about how mapping tools like Bowtie 2, BBMap, or BWA aligners would work with Hi-Fi reads. Are those some examples of things that don't work as well with PacBio long reads? Um, yeah, I, I can answer that. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, they, they don't tend to perform as well, and that's mostly because of the way their gap penalty is set. Um, you tend to get very large penalties um, for larger gaps um, in short read uh, aligners, which isn't the case when you're working with long read aligners because they set convex gap penalties and things like that. So um, we do tend to recommend just in general, whenever you're working with long read sequence data, to use long read aligners. There's a number out there. We do use Minimap2 um, or our own version of it, which is called PBMM2, which has a wrapper around it just to make setting up the settings a little easier. Um, but it, it just tends to be very fast and, and accurate. And that's one of the reasons we use that particular one, but there are lots of, of good long read aligners out there. Um, so no, we wouldn't recommend using Bowtie or BWA or any short read aligner uh, for, for long read data in general. Yeah, and for translation alignments, we've found that Diamond has specific long read settings and it just performs much more optimally with our data type. Awesome. Uh, are there any possibilities to do, still do shotgun sequencing with low DNA input? For example, if I'm only interested in detection and not necessarily assembly mags, and how much DNA would I need for that? So it's a really interesting question. Um, we do actually have a couple of low input um, DNA protocols. Um, I, I will say that we're still in the process of testing them for metagenomic samples. So we don't yet sort of know how well they perform in a manner where we can make you know, firm recommendations. I definitely think that's another area that's evolving um, and certainly something to keep an eye on. But I wouldn't necessarily say that, like, if you want to do long read sequencing of lower, you know, input amount samples to write it off and say, oh, I just don't have enough, um, because you may very well. Um, so I, I'd recommend reaching out to one of our scientists to discuss your project and then we can make better recommendations for your particular use case. Yeah, and we are currently in the process of evaluating our standard low and ultra low library preparation methods for metagenomics, but we don't actually have any results for that yet. So I can't speak to the quality of using low or ultra low input. Awesome. Okay, and then maybe one last question here. Uh, do mags include plasmids with the chromosomes or is there some way to connect them together? 
In the current pipeline, the plasmids, I don't believe, are being associated with the mags. Um, in general, when you run high canoe, you will receive quite a few contigs that are circular, and those represent a combination of both the complete uh, longer bacterial genomes and the shorter plasmid sequences. So um, a good place to start with uh, identifying those plasmids is directly from the assembly from high canoe. You can identify the circular contigs and then kind of look a little bit closer at what the content of those contigs are. Um, but no, I, I'm not sure how uh, you would go about actually incorporating the plasmid into the mag sequence because these methods are generally looking for completeness of a genome with regard to the genes that we expect to be within a bacterial genome and not necessarily any of these external um, uh, features. Uh, I can add to that. There have been a couple of customers who have done uh, kind of additional, um, not not supported by PacBio, uh, things to connect plasmids to a chromosome. So recently, or somewhat recently, there was a, a publication by Gang Fang and his student Jean Bolorier, and they used the methylation signatures in the sample to try to connect plasmids to chromosomes. Uh, and I know that his code is available uh, on GitHub for download if you want to try that yourself. Uh, another option is that we have customers who have used uh, high C, and when you use high C, you can layer that information on top and potentially connect viruses and plasmids to the chromosomes uh, that they were initially, um, you know, paired with back when they were intact bacteria. Um, but again, those are not um, protocols uh, supported by PacBio, uh, but they are possible uh, options for you if you want to, um, you know, read up on the literature and reach out to those authors. Okay, so um, in closing, uh, briefly, I wanna mention a few things. Uh, first, we've recorded the webinar and we'll have it available for download in the next several days. So keep an eye out for follow-up email with a link to that recording. And then secondly, you can stay up to date on all of our upcoming webinars by visiting and bookmarking packb.com slash events. And then last, uh, immediately following this webinar, you'll receive a very brief questionnaire. Please do take two minutes that you'll need to fill it out as it helps us develop new content for future webinars. So thanks again for joining us today, and I hope you'll join us again on a future webinar. And with that, take care and have a wonderful day. Bye.